still attends the board meeting, still participates in them. Still works up the papers. Yeah, his, his role is to make the recommendations to the board. Yep. yep. On that then, on number two, I think the very last line, if two were accepted as written, uh, it's reduced from seven to five? Yeah. That's correct. Thank you. So, any comment you wish to add, um, Andrew, or you? Uh, no, unless there's uh, questions. <laughs> uh, I think it's been, been said. <laughs> <Just here. laughs> I have a, a question which I raised last time, and since we have a different solicitor here, I would like to raise it again. And that is in the Constitution, because I still am not convinced of the answer I got. And that is in, in the Constitution, page 39, and Andrew, you will have the Constitution there. Page 39, it says, the company shall not, without written consent of the council, through its chief executive, do any of the following things. And point two, alter the shareholding as to change the effective control of the company. What I want in there is they will not sell any shareholding in the company without written consent from the council, not just a controlling interest. I agree with that. I completely but hang on, the answer was pretty clear last time. Do you wish to repeat the answer? No. <laughs> well, Andrew, well, I'd, rather well I'd, ra I'd like to hear Andrew's answer. We can't sell it anyway. Well, it's, no, a yeah, but, but it's a strategic asset. We ca it can't be touched. Why put it in the other one? Why just put it in um, In fact, the company... Um, that, that, what, what that's referring to is the, the company potentially issuing more shares to alter the... Alter the share. So the only way in which a company can alter its shareholding is effectively to either I issue more shares or buy back shares or in some way um, change the capital structure. Um, to alter, the, you say it specifically means create more shares, not sell existing shares. It has no role, and it's, it's the only, only entity that can sell the shares is the council, because that's the shareholder. But, mm. So a company doesn't sell shares in itself. No, no, so only the regional council, the regional council is the shareholder, only it can sell shares in the company. So the company has no role in saying, in selling, the company doesn't sell its own shares. Can, I just, own, can I just point of clarification, sure. C cannot, doesn't the board of directors have the right to issue more shares? Yes. And then they can choose to sell them down to anybody they like, as long as it's not a controlling interest or whatever the correct phrasing is. That, that's correct. So they can alter the, the capital structure by issuing more shares. So what we want to do is to not allow them to do that without coming to us first. And that's well, the point that Rex is making. Okay, so Section 45 of the Companies Act prevents them from issuing shares to uh, non-shareholders without, without the consent of those shareholders. So, so effectively the Companies Act has a, has a provision in it that requires on the issue of new shares that they be offered first to the existing shareholders pro rata. So that, that protection exists in, in the statute, which I brought in case <laughs> Councillor Graham asked me some. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, yes, so can I assure you that in fact the uh, the board of the company does not have a free reign in respect of the issue of additional shares. I don't need to extend that. I, that was exactly the same explanation I got before, so I will <laughs> I'll now accept it. <laughs> Different wording, same same outcome. Okay. Okay, so any any questions around um, anything else in here? Councillor Hewitt. Question for Andrew. My observation is that a well written constitution shouldn't need changing, it should be able to be adaptable as it stands. So are we right now with this constitution after the 30th of, mm -hmm. of June or I mean, it, are we doing it once and doing it properly? Perhaps I could answer that. I mean I think that certainly the advice that um, uh, had come from Mr Webster around this was by actually not being quite so prescriptive within the, within the constitution but um, describing the process and everything through a policy 
uh, that means effectively that the constitution should not need uh, changing. Yes. Yes. Councillor Bell. The uh, uh, number of councillors, a number of councillors, the number of um, uh, directors is set at three to seven maximum, three minimum, seven maximum. Uh, the three reflecting somebody's considered judgment that this entity could operate with three directors. Yes. Where does it, where did that come from? Where does the three come from? I don't have the history on on where that number uh, came from, but it's it's um, usual to oh, sorry, it's not uncommon for constitutions to prescribe a minimum number, and that's essentially a commercial question for the entity itself. So. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'd, I'd venture that it wasn't the lawyers who suggested no, that number. Or they might have suggested the number, but they would have asked whether that was appropriate. Councillor Dick or Scott may be able to help us here. I, I, my recollection of the of the three was based on the independent directors, and a lot of the modelling was done on what other investment slash holding companies do for councils throughout the country. So, three was settled on as as the minimum, and those three were independent. No, the expectation would be that that, um, that that's to allow flexibility in the event that certain directors come, uh, you know, resign or, or heaven forbid, die. No further questions. If we get to the recommendation, probably take them separately. Actually, I think certainly the first one separate from the rest of it. Um, has anyone got any thoughts on that, or someone happy to move that? Yeah. Well, one, one and two. Well, one and two. I'm happy with the one and two. One being the establishment of whether we have to go through a yeah. um, special consultative process or not. Someone happy to second one and two? Councillor Pipe. As amended. As, as amended, oh, yeah, yeah, from, yeah. thank you, um, and thank you for that, Councillor Belford, from seven to five. <coughs> okay, did you wish, wish to speak? I'll kick it off. Um, I oppose uh, the recommendation two, as previously said. Um, I don't support increasing the board um, for essentially a six-month period. Um, I don't. I, I'm opposed to appointing uh, essentially what is consultants uh, to the board, which I think is an entirely different role. So, um, just as a matter of principle and, and, uh, and my fundamental beliefs, I. I'm opposed to this. Thank you, Councillor Belman. Uh, I would second that. Uh, uh, on the one hand, uh, smart people have apparently decided that this board could function quite well, thank you, with three directors. Uh, and uh, uh, were we being asked in the first instance to appoint more directors to a board of HBRIC, I'm not convinced that these two would be the individuals we would settle upon for a whole variety of reasons. Uh, the work they're doing, they will continue to do, uh, whether they are elevated or not, uh, to director status. So there is no loss of their effort, it seems to me. Uh, and we, by our, we, we are about to uh, uh, endorse, I think, uh, the concept that three directors are sufficient to the task at hand. Uh, those three that have been serving uh, have have been very visible, public to the community, visible to the community, uh, are well regarded in the community, I think are of uh, cut from a different cloth than the consultants involved. Uh, and uh, I think the accountability for moving this project forward should rest uh, strictly with the three individuals who have carried it this far to date. Thank you. I'll speak in favour of the motion, if I may. Um, the the appointment process of these two individuals was done by Sheffield. We were looking for um, directors at the time. However, at the age and stage of the project, um, 
the the ability to appoint them as directors was going to involve a process that we're going through right now. And it was felt at the time that um, even though they were um, went through a process of being directors, because of the constitution and et cetera, and age of stage of pro project, it was suggested that it was a better fit to have them as subject matter experts um, and leave the council and um, independent directors together as, as a board of directors. So rather than adding, adding two or more to the mix, um, which was starting to get a little unwieldy for what it was essentially one project. Um, we went to the market and Sheffield did the work and, uh, and there was a high calibre of, um, of people that were put forward as directors. Um, the reason I support this fundamentally though is I believe that these people as directors of this company, rather than just subject matter experts, put their name, their reputation, everything else that goes with that um, behind this decision. And while the decision may not be any different than if they were subject matter experts, from where I'm sitting and the huge decisions that we're going to have to face um, as a council, that gives me a little more reassurance. Not a huge amount, but a little more reassurance. And on that basis, I, I support them becoming directors for this interim phase. Um, I also add that as a council, we need to um, expand on our policy. We need to to uh, give it a bit more meat, meat on the bones. It's uh, fairly light here and we haven't uh, got to that decision. That's, that's fair, but um, as we go forward, we need to make sure that uh, the decision of, of constitution, policy, etc., cetera, in, in the final composition of the board uh, for HBRIC Limited is uh, long-term. And I think at this stage, this is a good fit to get us to that long-term phase. So. Um, yeah, I'm going to support the uh, support the recommendation because I, I believe that having those extra two, uh, just following on from what you were saying, and having them sign off on the recommendation gives me uh, a higher level of confidence, I guess you could say, um, in the the recommendation that will come to us. I think a lot has been said around the table here about perceptions out there in the in the community, and I think in in some ways we're talking about a higher level of, of independence. That's also been talked around this table in, in, in other agenda items today about, about having that independence. And I think that this um, resolution actually leads to that and I'm, uh, I'll support it. Other speakers? Uh, Councillor Bevan. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I, um, I've taken my guidance from um, Andy Pearce as the chair of this uh, company. Um, his view is that um, the board is left thin with the exit of the three councillors and he wants these two people brought on. It's unfortunate that we don't have more information about them, although obviously they're known to some councillors, but, but not to me. I would like to have seen a little bit more information about them, but I'm happy to be guided by the, the chair of the company. Um, they're clearly up to speed with the, the function and activities of the company that are currently being carried out, and on that basis I'm prepared to support it. Councillor Dick. Well, I just think, quite simply, the task is far too large and far too important to have only three people taking responsibility. Um, simple as that. We need the five taking responsibility. Wish to sum up? I, I do, and Mr Chairman, if you wouldn't mind a little bit more than summing up, because I never got a chance to actually speak to the motion as the mover. But um, I, I certainly, moving it, um, have great um, uh, faith in, in a, suggesting that these two people be formally appointed to the board. They are brought onto the board as subject matter um, experts really to beef the governance of the board at the time and, and as a way of beefing that governance with the expertise that the other board members felt was lacking. In particular, um, Ms Dinsdale's um, qualifications and, and law actually have been an extremely wide knowledge of pri private public partnerships. And I think when we're looking at um, some of the issues around the um, 
feasibility, um, that, that knowledge of how those partnerships work is, is going to be very essential to us. And uh, Mr Faulkner's experience in large construction is and, and dealing with the processes around large construction, not, not just the construction itself, but dealing with all that um, aspects around procurement, etc., is, is very important in, in understanding that. When it comes to bringing the recommendation, I'm hoping the whole board will front up to that recommendation. If we've got these as so-called consultants somewhere out the back, we don't get a chance to question them. I want them here, I want them taking accountability and I want to be able to question them. And I think that brings a much greater rigour to the whole process. Actually financially doesn't alter the um, makeup of the board at all, but it actually gives a strength to the governance which I think is, is very important. And as Councillor Bevan has said, it's certainly a strength that um, the chairman of HBRIC has indicated that he wants to see maintained. So. Um, I am very pleased to see them formally appointed to the board and know that they will perform their job extremely well.